I'm not making any money talking these days. Good Christ, 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 Christ. <laughs> Dick, folks. I'm not gonna lie to you. Still am. I guess I am a decent guy because I'm a, a, I'm a fucking jerk, uh, and I'm not a jerk. Apparently, I'm a dick. I'm not an awful guy, but I've just I've done so much ridiculous stuff. Man, I am. Uh, man, I'm an awful guy. Hey, what's happening? This is the Forty Year Old Boy Podcast. Mike Schmidt coming to you live from a living room somewhere in California. I'm not gonna tell you where. You know what? That's a contest. Write me in. The first guy to guess where I'm at gets five dollars from Eric Butterfield, my producer from his apartment here in Riverside. Oh, gave it away. Contest is over. Uh, yeah, I'm in Riverside this week. That's right. Uh, that's how I like to do it. Uh, it actually isn't at all how I like to do it. I don't want to come to Riverside, the land that time forgot, but police remembered. I have no interest in being here, but uh, I have to because my house, my uh, apartment, my lovely place is a, uh, it's a Petri dish. I'm not going to lie to you folks. My wife has been uh, taken ill. She has been seized by the croup. And we are only hoping that the leeches that we've applied to her before I left town will go ahead and get this disease out of her. <laughs> uh, she doesn't have the croup. Uh, she has the whooping cough. She has anything with oop in it. That's what she's got. She's got, uh, you know what she's got? Cantaloupe by us three. That's a terrible disease. Bitty bitty bop. That's, she just walks around saying that all day long. And I, it's terrible. There's nothing I can do about it. Uh, and she's got lupus. Uh, actually my neighbor, the, that's my racist bartender neighbor, lupus. That's uh, I talked about him in another episode. All right. Uh, no, Karen this week decided to get pneumonia and, uh, that's pneumonia with a P not an N. Uh, although there is an N in there too. Uh, she wouldn't got pneumonia and it's the kind of, and it's funny. She has walking pneumonia. Uh, so it's not the crazy, you know, put her in the hospital pneumonia. It's that kind where you can't move. I had walking pneumonia when I was a kid and, uh, and it's awful because if you exert yourself in any way, you have coughing fits. To, to the point where you, what I would do, because I was a child, uh, not that I'm not a child now, but back then I was really a child, I had walking pneumonia, and yet I still would play football, like sandlot football with my friends, this is in seventh grade, and, uh, and I would, you know, we'd run a play, and then I would cough and cough until I threw up, like I would literally have to call time out, go to the sidelines, and throw up or dry heave, and then come back into the game. Because uh, I apparently thought I was somebody's hero and I had to go ahead and do that. Uh, no, because I just loved playing football. It was like, it was a fun time. When you're a kid, you know, you don't want that stuff to go away because eventually you wind up 40 doing a radio show for nobody. So you want to make sure you hold on to those kids. That's my message to you. Hold on to all of your diseases and anything else you can as a child because you will look back fondly on every horrible thing that ever happened to you. Uh, so Karen's got pneumonia and then she gives me strep throat, which is great. Uh, she didn't, well, I mean, I, I caught it. I mean, she didn't really give it to me. It's not like she held me down and sneezed in my face over and over until I got it. Uh, but I, I, and I, I'm self-diagnosed by the way, with strep throat. It's gone now because I saw a doctor this morning, but, uh, you know, Karen's got pneumonia and she's all screwed up. And then I wind up with a really like a sore throat. And I found out from WebMD, WebMD that, uh, sore throat, a rapid sore throat accompanied by white spots in the throat is strep throat. So then I went to go to look in the mirror and I had, I, my, I had like a Dalmatian in my throat. That's how horrible it was. Like crazy white spots. And uh, it looked like a Dr. Seuss character I had swallowed. And, uh, and so I told Karen, I go, look, do me a favor. Take a look at my throat and see what you think. So I'm, I'm, she looks at my throat and I'm like, ah, I got my tongue out. And she can't see. She says, oh, I can't see anything. Who can't see this? Hu I, have a, I have an archery target in the back of my throat. You can't see that. And she says, well, wait, let me take a look. She gets a flashlight. My wife goes ahead and gets our earthquake preparedness kit out and takes a flashlight and jams it into my mouth. Uh, so now I'm sitting there with a plastic cock in my mouth trying to appear comfortable as she looks in to try to diagnose. And I can't believe she couldn't see it because it looked like it looked like I had a coral reef in the back of my throat. And yet she's just like, I can't. You got to bend down. I can't see. It. You can't see it. There's a cauliflower in the back of my throat. Seriously, you can't pull that because it's should I take a photo and have it developed so you can check it out? Because honestly, it's huge. Cause that's what I do. I like to get mad at my wife when she has pneumonia and I like to berate her as much as I possibly can. Uh, and I wish that wasn't true, but it, it is true because I, I'm not going to lie to you folks. I hate sick people and, uh, I, I am not good with sick because I am so selfish that all I can think of when somebody is sick is what it means for me and how I'm going to have to do extra things. Like, you know, my wife gets sick and they're like, Oh, she's got pneumonia. And I'm like, great. That means I got to fill a prescription. Oh, 
I mean, I don't want to go to, I don't want to go out of my apartment to come here and do this, let alone go to Walgreens up the street and fill a prescription or five prescriptions, which my wife needed, by the way, she needed eye drops. She needed, uh, you know, she's got steroids. She's got all sorts of nonsense going on. So she's, but she has pneumonia. They found like they said there was crackling in her lungs and, uh, it, it, but here's the good news. My wife though, uh, she's a trooper. She's got her pneumonia still smoking. Good for you, honey. Way to pull out that pack of cigarettes and fly right in the face of convention and suck back some more cancer. That's fantastic. Uh, yeah, I'll tell you that my wife had cancer. My wife actually had cancer, still smoking, smoked through cancer, still smoking now. Unbelievable. Just like literally telling medical science, you know what? Blow me. Not interested in what you have to say, because I'm going to go ahead and be the one person who survives by smoking their entire life. Uh, and I don't want to hear from smokers telling me that it's not that bad. I actually had that argument with my little brother, my brother, my, I have four brothers. Okay. My older brother, Fredo, who I don't talk to a lot. Uh, and then and by a lot, I mean, ever, uh, I'll say hi to him. He lives. It's all right. I can't, I can't go into that now, but I'll, I'll tell that story another time about, uh, uh that, but my youngest brother, Scott, uh, is insane. There I've said it. Uh, my brother, Scott and I have come to blows like a few times, but not really like he's, he's one of these guys who's constantly angry. Wait a minute. That sounds very familiar. Hold on a second. Why would he be like that? No, Scott's, but he's like nuts angry. Like uh, this is all right. <laughs> My brother, uh, Scott, w- one time I lived with Scott uh, in an apartment and uh, I, I slept in the living room and uh, on a futon and he slept in the bedroom. Well, he went and got a kitten and uh, he didn't get the kitten uh, fixed. So the kitten still had claws. So I would sleep in the living room and then whenever I would move, this thing would leap on me like I was, uh, you know, an animal on the attack. It would just, and uh, the cat's name was T-Ball and uh, T-Ball would jump on me and totally uh, claw the shit out of me. So I finally told Scott, I go, look, seriously, you, you know, you got to get this cat fixed because uh, this is when I, uh, I was dating Karen at the time. And, uh, you know, when you're living in an apartment with your brother and sleeping on a futon and you've actually found a woman who will still stay with you, you don't want to have it screwed up by having her be attacked by a cat in the middle of the night. So you tell me, I told my brother, I go, dude, seriously, you got to get this thing fixed. It's jumping on Karen. I'm sleeping. It's jumping on me. And he would say, all right, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. But he would never do it. So then we wound up in a huge raging fight one day and I'm like, you know what? You got to get this cat fixed. You got to take care of it and get it for the claw. And he's screaming at me. I'm screaming at him. So I pick up the kitten and I'm yelling at him and I'm holding it and I'm screaming and he's screaming at me and I whip this fucking cat right off his chest. I, I mean, I just went J.R. Richard, Roger Clemens, fucking rocket fastball, bang. And it just, it hits him dead center. It goes flying. He, and he, then of course, I've, I'm now the winner in anger poker at that point because I'm the nut who, with, I, this is a history I have with my brothers. We'll have arguments. My brothers and I will have arguments and we'll all, we'll, we'll go all in with the anger. We'll all keep, you know, I've, I've got two pair of anger. Really? Well, I've got a full house of anger and we're going back and forth. And then inevitably one of us will do something stupid and that will always be me. And then my brother will stop and look at me and go, man, you need help. Always. One time I'm in my car with my brother, Andy, my brother, Glenn, my brother, Scott. We're driving. Andy's uh, Andy's behind the wheel of the car and I'm in the passenger seat and it turns into an argument like a four way argument. We're all going at it and Andy's involved. And I got to tell you, I love my brother, Andy right now. uh, I'm talking to two of my four brothers. Andy's one of them. He is the closest one to me, uh, but he 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 somehow went the other way in temperament like he completely scaled back like he doesn't get any confrontations whatsoever. He's the kind of guy who, you know, when he gets mad, it's trouble because he never gets mad. So we're in the car and we're going at it and he's driving and he's screaming at me and I'm screaming at him and I just punch him right in the face (laughs) on the freeway. We're driving on the freeway. I blast him with a right hand as he's trying to drive the car. We're all in the car. But at that point, I'm insane. I'm just like, you know what? I couldn't care less. We can go into a divider. I, I have no interest in stopping. And I just blasted him right in the face. So, yeah. So I mean, we're all nuts. But my brother Scott is he's nuts to the, you know, he's this guy on Thanksgiving Day. Uh, we were at my mom's house. And he is telling us because, you know, he smokes. All my brothers smoke. My entire family smokes except me. So I'm, you know, it's basically like I'm sitting in Philip Morris's waiting room as as I'm waiting for the turkey to come out. And we're not even, by the way, we don't have the oven on. The turkey is just on the counter being cooked by secondhand smoke. That's how it's going to be. And we're going to go ahead and eat a delicious carcinogen filled bird. So I'm sitting there and uh, uh, Scott is telling me that cigarettes do not cause cancer. And he means it. 
and it's and I, I will say to him, look, dude, y- y- don't just don't even do this. I don't know why you're doing this. Are you just you're just trying to start a fight or be contrary or whatever? He's like, hey, man, you know what? They they can put those warnings on there all they want, but it's like there's no real proof. There's no real proof. People are dying when they smoke. Hey, man, I smoked a long time. I'm not dead. Mom smoked her whole life. She's not dead. She's going to die eventually. Her insides right now look like the uh, a melted chocolate bar. I mean, it's going to be horrible inside of her lungs. Yeah, but you know what, man? They can say whatever they want, but it's just the government trying to tell you, oh my God, stop. But that's my brother. That's who he is. So uh, so Karen, luckily, isn't that crazy. She doesn't give me the speech where cigarettes don't cause cancer, but she gives me the sub speech of cigarettes didn't cause my cancer because uh, she had breast cancer and she's saying, oh, the cigarettes had nothing to do with that. Okay, well, You've had cancer once and beaten it. Why would you want to give cancer? It's literally like you beat cancer. Cancer is sitting in the corner staring at you, just rubbing its hands furiously going, oh, I cannot wait to get a second chance at you. And you continue to smoke and invite cancer into your house. Why would you do that? I have no idea. Yeah. So, uh, so Karen continues to tempt fate with cancer, but she, uh, you know, she was coughing for a week. Like she was sick. And we didn't do anything about it because we just figured everybody's sick. You know, my buddy Pat was down for like six days. Everybody's ill. And she'll get over it. She'll fight it off with medicine. She's taking cough syrup. But then Sunday night, she starts coughing up blood. And we're like, all right, well, that's bad. Uh, so we wind up going to the emergency room. And, uh, you know, the emergency room is just a brick. I mean, it is so awful to go to the emergency On top of the fact that you're sick, then you have to sit there in this room with other sick people. And everybody's kind of moaning or they're upset. Or they're the relative of somebody who's upset. Or they're like me and they can't stand being there because they hate sick people. Imagine hating sick people and having to sit in a room full of sick people. Awful. And the only thing worse than, than that would be when the three cholos came in and they decided to say that one of their hand hurts and then they would sit there and fart and laugh in the emergency room. Literally three guys who came in. One guy's like, yeah, my hand hurts. Holds it up. He's got like a swollen knuckle. And then the three of them sat there and talked about firing guns and literally farting and in in, in laughing out loud. And a woman comes in. She's like, my husband just had a stroke. I need to find out where he is. They start laughing at this woman whose husband has just had a stroke. Not really laughing at her. I think maybe just laughing at the misfortune of others because, you know, they're insensitive pricks. And uh, and then who and in my head, I go, well, you know what? There's three of them. The big guy's got a hurt hand. So if I hit him first, uh, that's fine. I got to take him out. And then the two small guys I have to deal with because the hurt hand's probably not going to want to hit me. Uh, and if he does, I'll just hit him in the hand. It's no big deal. Uh, and then in my head, I'm like, why are you planning a fight in the emergency room? You're the stupidest man who's ever lived. But then part of me went, you know what? If you're going to fight, why not in the emergency room? Just in case something happens to you or them, everything's taken care of. And, uh, you know, and maybe with any luck, you'll get arrested and you won't have to sit here with all these sick people. Uh, so we go into the emergency room and my wife is getting, uh, she had to get breathing treatments. They had to put a mask on her with uh, like saline solution and some medicine. And she had to sit there and breathe it in. And it's just, you know, I, I'm, I'm glad they're taking care of her and you want to be there with her. You're holding her hand and making sure everything's fine. But at the same time, you know, I'm a child. So I'm selfishly going, I gotta get the hell out of here. I mean, I hate this. It's boring. So I started to walk around. And when you walk around in the emergency room, you inevitably peek in at people for some reason. <laughs> and, uh, uh, so I'm walking and, I'm, you know, you look in at people and they're, and they're all sick and I don't know why I'm looking in at them. That's not helping me or helping them. And then their relatives are like, what are you looking at? Terrible. So I'm getting in trouble in the emergency room. Uh, then I go to use the restroom and, uh, you know, I walk out, there's a dead person. They had called a cold blue and, uh, they said it was in some triage, whatever the cold blue and Karen and I are like, Oh, you know, I've seen enough ER to know what that means. And, uh, uh, so I, and there's a person with a sheet pulled up over their head and there's cops there. And I'm like, oh, that is awful. I mean, it makes everything go into perspective. You know, the, the cholos and the fighting and the me and my wife with the breathing mask. And, you know, and then all of a sudden you, the seriousness of what's going on and where you're at kind of hits home. So I'm a little thrown by that. So I, I actually go and I use the restroom and it, it's weird. It's like a movie where I actually looked in the mirror and I'm like, you're an idiot. You know, grow up. What are you upset about? You, you could be that person. Your wife could be that person. Seriously, don't don't put any more credence into this. Just go ahead and get through this and get home and take care of your wife. So then I walk out of the bathroom, the corpse that has a sheet over it now has its feet up. Like it's laying down and it has its feet up and you can see under the sheet and the corpse is not wearing pants. It's a woman and I've got a full on gupper shot on this woman. And I'm like, seriously, dead gupper shot. That's what I'm going to take home from the fucking emergency room. But it turns out and the cops are like laughing as they try to like, all of a sudden this person rousts this person is in for a DUI and shit their pants 
So they took the pants off the person. That's why she's naked from the waist down. And she pulled the sheet up over her own head because she didn't like the lights and she was trying to take a nap. <laughs> so I went from having perspective brought into my life to walking out and seeing a, a fucking huge gupper shot right in my face from some drunk. And, and, when, and let me tell you, when I say huge gupper shot, I'm not kidding. Unfortunately, this... Uh, I don't know how many kids this woman had, but, uh, it, it, and quite frankly, she had a DUI. She may have crashed into her own vagina because it was the biggest thing I, I ever, it was like literally Dwayne from a previous episode. He would have been like, sir, I honestly, I'm going to need some friends to get in there because it was huge. And then I'm walking and she takes a look and she peeks out from the sheet and she's like, what are you? she literally said, what are you looking at? To me so now she went from being a corpse that i felt bad for to someone who's going to take a poke at me from naked from the waist down and she's like what are you looking at and uh uh the cops are like then they look at me and uh, uh you know and honestly i was going to say something back but i was very worried about the echo bothering the other patients in the other rooms so i decided you know what just go ahead and pass on this one and i went back to visit my wife so eventually karen and i uh you know after seven hours and four breathing treatments and five prescriptions we wound up getting out of the uh the hospital and then went home and she's fine now uh went to the doctor this morning her strip my strep throat's gone and her everything is gone so we're all fine but uh and it got me thinking though when you go to the emergency room it got me thinking of other times that i've been in the emergency room and uh, there were two that stand out actually one of which and it's funny because i, I did um paul goebel's podcast the king of tv's podcast this past week and he told a story that was kind of like this and i was going to chime in with mine uh but then we got talking about something else so i didn't get to say it so i'll tell it here uh i used to work at a pizza place in chicago it was uh it worked out great i, I would work there during the day and then do comedy at night i was actually the house mc at the at the funny bone in naperville illinois which was there my friend bert borth ran it and uh uh you know i worked at this pizza and actually it's funny my brother scott worked at this pizza place with me and we had a fight uh in, in a couple times one time i just dragged him outside and i, I literally was going to fight him out in the parking lot of this pizza place because i am retarded i can't i cannot stress enough it, it's so funny my brothers would always say to me man you need help or you need to you know because i am we have five brothers i have four brothers and i am the only brother who's had a physical altercation with all of my brothers like so i've actually fought all four of my brothers so they like i said I, they think i'm insane and uh but you know perhaps they're right but uh all i know is there was one you know scott and i are outside in aprons and i you know i'm standing there like jack johnson and jack dempsey with the mark you know crazy marcus to queensberry fists up and uh yeah that was not good but uh so i worked at this pizza place and uh Pacero's pizza in lyle illinois go and enjoy it so i had a don the uh, proprietor and uh one day I, I would work as a prep cook so i would have to do you know you make food but then also when you're doing prep slicing lunch meat and and you know making spaghetti and making chicken soup whatever so uh I'm working on the meat slicer and it was funny. Don always told me, he's like, look, don't be careful because that is the worst insurance ding in the world is if something happens on the meat slicer, anything else, you know, burns from the oven, everything, you know, you can kind of explain away. It's, it's supposed to happen. But if you ever do something on the meat slicer, it's just, it's really awful for my insurance rate. So be careful. And it's funny because my mom used to work at Huck Finn Donuts in Chicago when she was a teenager and she actually cut the tip of her finger off with a meat slicer. Uh, so I'm familiar with, with the meat slicer and, uh, and the dangers contained within, uh, but I would work on it. I'm slicing, whatever, I'm slicing turkey. You got to slice ham, slice, you know, we sliced our own lunch, meat, made subs, whatever. So one day I'm slicing turkey and I'm talking and I've got my hand on the turkey. That's one thing you're not supposed to do, by the way, on the meat slicer is have your hand on the meat because there's a guard that you're supposed to put there. But when you're down near the end, like the heel of a big, uh, 10 pound, you know, turkey breast, you try to hold it. So it it hits the meat slicer properly and it doesn't bunch up and slice improperly. So I'm holding it and I'm talking to somebody and I'm moving my hand across the meat slicer and I'm not looking because it's just something you're doing. And all of a sudden, it, 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 if you've ever had an injury, you know, even a broken leg or a broken wrist or something like that, at first it doesn't hurt. You don't know what happened. But then eventually you go, oh, so I'm, I've got my hand over the meat slicer and then I feel Fimp! like it feel, I, it bit me. Basically, it, that's the term I would use it bit me and my hand got pulled down into the blade by the blade. And I went right over the top and I was like, Oh wow, it bit me. And then I turned it around and I am telling you, it looked like Michael Myers had gotten a hold of me because I couldn't even see where the cut was. All I saw was blood pooling out of my hand and running down my arm. Now, you know, immediately, and now the lunch rush is starting. So now I've, I've cut my hand and I'm, I'm bleeding crazy. So then you put gauze on it. It's a, you know, it's, I've worked in kitchens a million times. You go ahead and you run it underwater and you put gauze on it. But as I'm putting the gauze on it, 
it I mean the blood is it continues to stream out of my it looks like you ever see the beginning of the Beverly Hillbillies when Jed shoots the ground and the blood comes bubble up comes a bubble and crude that's what's coming out of my hand I mean it will not stop and it's it's rushing out like crazy like a faucet almost so I'm now I'm putting pressure on it I'm doing that and I tell you know, Keith, the, the, uh, the manager, the guy who runs the joint. I said, Hey dude, uh, I just cut myself on the slicer and that's not good. And he looks at it and he's like, Jesus, well, you know, relax. We'll try to figure out what we can do. Well, the lunch rush happens. And I'm this guy who, uh, when I make a mistake and it's a stupid mistake, which most of my mistakes are, I try to make up for it by overcompensating in some way. So now I'm upset because now I know Don is going to be dinged for the insurance because of something stupid that I did. So these guys are also shorthanded in the lunch rush. I can't let that happen. So I figure I'll go and help cook. So I take my hand and I wrap paper towels around my hand. And then I put a plastic bag over my hand and then I duct tape it to my arm. And I walk up to the front and I jump right in. I'm like, oh, what do we need? Because it's, it was a really busy place for lunch. So I jump in and I'm making hot dogs and I'm doing everything pretty much left-handed because my right hand is useless at this point. Uh, and I'm, I'm making hot dogs and I'm scooping out soup. I'm getting tamales, whatever I got to do. And I'm like, all right, who's next? What's going on? Da, da, da. And as I'm doing this stuff and I'm making food, I go for about 10 minutes and I don't really think about what's happening because you get into the groove of cooking and making sure everything's taken care of. So then I hear a guy go, hey, hey, uh, uh, you know what? you probably shouldn't be making food. And I look at him and he goes, you shouldn't be. And he points at my hand and I look and this bag is filled with blood. The bag that's over my hand is, is it looks now it looks like I cut my hand off and put a plastic bag over my arm and continued to work. That's how much blood is in this bag. And my hand is covered in bloody paper towels. So it looks like a stump. I look like something out of night of the living dead. And I'm trying to make this guy a fucking hot dog. So I've got literally like just this bag of blood. It looks like a, a balloon filled with blood, like like the the worst balloon fight you could ever imagine. And it's uh, uh and my hand is a uh, and it's covered in paper towels, which are now soaked in blood. So it I, I I look like I stuck my hand in a propeller before I decided to make this guy lunch. So I I have to bow out at that point, and now I have to go to the emergency room because the bleeding won't stop, and I don't know what to do. And I didn't want to go because I didn't want Don to get dinged insurance wise, but I had to go. So uh, finally, I call Karen. I tell her I'm fine. But then somebody takes me to the emergency room. And, uh, and I'm still... And what's funny, this is another thing about the emergency room. If you walk in and you tell them... And, and you know, if you have a, a head wound, I would imagine they would take care of you right away. So I go to the counter of the emergency room and I tell them... Uh, uh, you know, I, sh- I basically just show them my hand. She goes, all right, well, you got to fill out this form and then have a seat. Fill out this form? I got I to hand out a Papillon. Fill out a form. What are you talking about? Uh, so the person I was with had to fill it out. And, and I, then I go in the back and I sit there. And I'm in the emergency room like five hours. They came in periodically and cleaned it, but they didn't do anything for it. Uh, And and what they wound up doing, because they couldn't give me stitches because my hand went over the blade and it just shaved meat off the heel of my hand. So they were like, you're going to be fine. We just got to wrap it up with gauze. It's just going to heal on its own. You can't work for a couple days. So I go back to work and uh, I'm getting everything straightened out. Like I said, it's five hours later and everybody's cool. And they're like, are you okay? I'm fine. They're fine. They clean the slicer. Everything's taken care of. And, uh, and then I mentioned, I go, uh, Hey, did, uh, did anybody, you know, what'd you guys do with the Turkey? They're like, Oh, well, we wrapped it up and put it away. I said, great. Um, you know, I never found the piece of my hand that I cut off when I was chopping up the Turkey. And they're like, Oh, we thought you might've, you grabbed it and got it out. I go, no, no, I didn't. Uh, uh, it was the last thing on my mind, quite frankly, after my hand went over the spinning blade and cut a chunk out of my hand to think, you know what? I got to find this chunk of my hand. And if you know anything about a Caucasian white guy hand, uh, I'm going to imagine a piece of it when it's cut off looks a lot like turkey breast. So I go, fellas, we got to do this. Yeah, you can't. And they're like, all right. So we actually pulled the turkey, all of it. I, I made them get all of it because they're like, well, you're sure. And I go, get it out. So we pull out the turkey breast. And I, 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 you know what? Also, by the way, I shouldn't make it sound like they were fighting me on it. They were just kind of like, are you sure that you didn't do anything? But they wanted it out too. It's believe this place got an A. They're a nice place. Don't please go eat there. I, and it's been 10 years. I'm sure there isn't a piece of my skin laying around anymore. Uh, but sure enough, we pull out the turkey breast and uh, uh, in one of the packages, we pull it apart. There it is. There's a big uh, piece of my hand. Threw away all the turkey. Just chucked it out. So yeah, it's, uh, it's amazing how much your hand looks like turkey when it's cut open. I guess that's the message I bring to all of you tonight. <laughs> tonight, it's today. Or it's tonight. If you're listening to it tonight, who knows? It could be nighttime for you. I have no idea. Uh, I've been I've been in the emergency room quite a few times actually. Another time that I went was in uh, I was in I lived in Lake Tahoe, and I was bouncing at a club. And uh, when I was bouncing at this club, I actually I worked. It was funny. I worked in a pizza place there too. 
Uh, because you know why? Because that's what I do. Because I, I didn't fucking graduate college, so I am the guy who has to work these serial killer jobs. Unless I can talk, uh, I, I'm useless. Unless I have a job where I'm speaking. And by the way, it that's not even true. Because I've had jobs where I have to speak, and I've blown those too. Because any sales job that I have, I am the worst at. Because you know what? I am the guy who takes no for an answer. I don't know if anybody else does out there, but I am absolutely that guy. You tell me no one time, fantastic. All right, nice talking to you. I had a guy, I had a telemarketing job one time and, uh, it, it was July and it's, you know, you know, nobody wants to be in an office in July at night. I mean, it's just terrible. And I'm calling people taking surveys for La Quinta inns. And I, I called up this guy and I'm like, Hey, sir, can I ask you some questions about La Quinta? And he goes, the fucking all-star game is on and hangs up on me as if I had somehow, you know, kicked God in the face. He was that mad at me because the, the all-star game was on and I called him and, and you know what, now that I'm old, I understand that. I can't, I mean, I didn't like telemarketing and I certainly didn't like telemarketers when they called, but now I, I really hate them. But I, and I, but I, you know what I hate more than telemarketers? People who fuck with telemarketers. I hate that, that, that goofy practical joke. Hey, guess what? I taped myself making uh, weird noises at a guy who tried to sell me something. That's terrible. Just hang up the fucking phone. Why are you wasting time with that? It makes no sense. That person is trying to do a job. Granted, it's a horrible, horrible job, but having been on the other end of that job, nobody wants to have you making chimp noises and pretending an old guy died in the bathroom. I don't fucking care about that. I'm just trying to make sure that you go ahead and take these light bulbs off my hands. You know, cause I, I actually, I had a job. I had a job selling light bulbs once where I had to, in the script, it actually said that I was a disabled veteran and I was trying to get people to buy these light bulbs to, to help America or something. I don't know what it was, but is that the best use of America's war dead to try to get people to switch to a fluorescent bulb? I don't think it is quite frankly. And so I bail on that job after like, a, and I don't need any excuse to bail on a job, but that was enough. Of, I think that was a pretty good excuse for me to bail. Uh, and then you work in telemarketing. There's all these people who make up fake names for themselves. There was a guy who used to call himself Elliot Rosewater. I don't know why I remember that. That's fucking 24 years ago that I worked with this guy. And yet I remember he called himself Elliot Rosewater. Makes no sense. All right. So what the hell was I talking about? Serial killer jobs. Exactly. Thank you, Eric. <laughs> I, uh, th that's what I've done is I've had, you have to go and take jobs like that because nobody, whatever. So I've been lucky enough to be able to kind of carve out a living writing and, and talking because if there's any sort of regular job, forget about it. I'm fucking finished. And, uh, I, I wound up working uh, in Tahoe. I was bouncing and working in a pizza place. So when I worked at the pizza place, I met these two women, uh, Katie and Candy. And I should tell you at the time, like when I moved to Tahoe, I weighed like 350 pounds. So by the time I got the job at the pizza place, because a bunch of stuff had happened, I wound up losing, like, I think I'd lost a hundred pounds. So I was down about 250. I was down to 240 actually. And, but I was still wearing the clothes that a 350 pound guy would wear because I had no money either. So it was Candy and Katie. And I actually, I started dating Candy actually. And, uh, this was, what year was this? This was 87, 88. So I was like, uh, Candy is actually who I lost my virginity to at the age of 20, 21, 20, 21. I don't know, but uh, I wanted losing it to her. But and of course, the whole time pining away for Katie, her friend, because that's my life. I'm fucking Lloyd Dobler on somebody's lawn with a boombox trying to get him to like me. And, uh, you know, wound up with, and it was funny. I was with Candy, uh, but then, you know, I was a young guy and she was like 38, I think. And I was like 20, 20 or 21. And, uh, and we were dating. And then one time she brought home this young like nurse person that she worked in a hospital and she brought home a nurse uh, named Pam. And uh, Pam... <laughs> Pam was hitting on me, like right in Candy's house. And in my head, you know, cause now I'm 21 and I've actually gotten laid now for the first time. So now I'm thinking, all right, all bets are off. I can fuck everybody. And, uh, you know, I'm in Candy's house, Candy, who's bought me clothes and been nice to me. And I'm still flirting heavily with Pam as we lay under a blanket, watching television together. Uh, awful. Just not a, not a good thing to do. Uh, but I, so then eventually I wind up nailing Pam, uh, cause she comes to the bar where I'm working and I'm bouncing. So I, and she takes me to her, this is, uh, she takes me to her house and she's like, you got to be really quiet. I said, okay. So I go in uh, with Pam to sleep with her. And, uh, and she's like, seriously, you, got, you can't make any noise. And I'm like, well, I'm not exactly, you know, fucking Kim Cattrall and Porky's, but I'll try to keep it down. And that's an old reference for anybody my age. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm not a screamer, but I mean, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm down for business. So, and she's like, no, shh, you can't say anything. So it was like this really just a silent fuck, like in her house. And I'm banging her. And then as I'm banging her, I noticed she's got pictures like framed pictures of a guy in like a, a military uniform. And I say, I go, who's this? And she's like, that's my fiance. He's in the Marines. So Pam took, and it's like, so I'm, a, I'm, I'm blameless in this, by the way, uh, if you're still married to Pam and you're listening to this by some crazy <laughs> happenstance, uh, she took me to your house. And by the way, it was your house because I found out the reason I had to be quiet. Your mom was asleep in the next room. 
That's right. Her fiance's, her future mother-in-law is asleep in the next room. And this woman still brought me home to bang me, which I think bottom line tells you I was a catch. So let me send a belated apology to uh, Mr. Pam, wherever he is, if he's listening, because uh, again, <laughs> it was my fault. Uh, I, I was at it because you know, you know how it is. Once you get laid for the first time, you're ready for anything. I mean, you, you'll stick your dick in a soda can if the hole's big enough. You don't care at that point. Is that just me? Eric gave me a look like, like absolutely not. <laughs> maybe, maybe I'm alone on that. And uh, yeah, you remember stick your dick in a soda can too, right? That was a game you played when you were growing up. It was fantastic. Uh, so anyway, I wind up bouncing at this club and I, I hang out with Katie and Candy and I pine for Katie. That's my, my whole deal is I, I uh, you know, I get, and it's funny, Katie's married, she's got kids and she's banging my roommate DJ and I'm just, and, but the whole time, you know, hanging out with me, that's always been my thing. I'm always the wingman who like sets it up and then somebody else has closed the deal and uh, it was awful. So Katie and I wind up hanging out and uh, we hang out all the time. We go out dancing, we do everything. We do everything except fuck because she's doing that with DJ and it makes me sick. So uh, we wind up going to a bar one night and I'm wearing, uh, I, this is important to the story. I'm wearing a duster, uh, a duster coat, like a three quarter length Columbine black trench coat. <laughs> Uh, cause I looked very cool. It was very important. We went to turtles nightclub, so I had to look my best. And, uh, it's me and Katie and my roommate ransom and a couple other people. And we go out to uh, this bar and it's eighties night, uh, which for, you know, it's funny. Eighties night for Katie is kind of a joke. Eighties night for me is my high school years. So I know every word to every single song that plays because Katie was probably like 34, 35 at the time, 35, 35 married kids. And, uh, we're sitting there. And so the song, <laughs> I'm actually blushing telling the story because it's retarded but uh the song don't you want me by the human league comes on and i've always been a guy who's you know kind of ridiculous and i don't mind a retarded public display because it might be funny so we were singing 80 songs anyway when they would come on so then this song comes on with don't you want me by the human league and i start singing don't you want me but instead of don't you want me baby i'm singing don't you want me katie and i'm singing it at the top of my lungs and she, and you know, it's funny because it's like, ha ha, isn't this funny? But at the same time, in my small mind, 21 years old, thinking this might be impressive enough to get her to like me. And uh, it was, again, I, oh God, freaked out telling it because it's so, it's just such a, you ever think, look back on things you've done and your skin crawls because of how stupid you were. And you're like, God, why did I do that? This is one of those moments. So we're in this, I mean, we're in a bar, we're in a crowded nightclub and I'm going, don't you want me, Katie? And I'm singing it loud in a crowded bar, but I'm loud. I'm, I'm, I'm the kind of guy, like I, my mom used to send me to yell for my brothers and I would yell and they could hear me from like five blocks away. I'm crazy loud. It's ridiculous. Like I'm so loud that if I yelled next to you, you would feel sound coming out of my mouth. Like I'm a, a superhero of, of volume. It's crazy. So I'm singing, don't you want me Katie at the top of my lungs? And she's cracking up. And, and it's funny because you think that that's cool when you're doing it, but you really know that it's not, but you still think it's kind of cool because the girl is even paying any attention to you at all. You think it's fine. And there's nothing. Have you ever, why am I asking a question? Have you ever done that? That's the stupidest thing I've ever done. Cause you're not going to answer me. Maybe you'll answer me out loud on a treadmill somewhere, but, uh, but I've actually done. And then I did it again. Like I did, I sang to her back in, you know, a, a million years ago, but then in like 1992, I was uh, dating a girl named Stephanie. And, uh, we had a, a, a stormy, uh, romance where we would, we'd be dating and then we'd break up and then we'd be dating and then we'd break up. Uh, just awful. So, uh, I'm on the phone with her in the middle of one of our breakups once. And I actually sang to her on the phone. I sang, come back to me by Janet Jackson. You know that song? Come back to me. I'm begging you, please. And I, I'm sure Eric will attest to this. I am blushing now telling the story because you think it's such a good idea because you're like so wrapped up in getting this person back and you're with this girl and you're like, this is great. This is going to work. And I, the thing is, I knew it didn't work because I had done it fucking eight years before and it didn't work. Not even eight years. Like, no, four years, four years before. And yet still thought it was a good plan. And but there is nothing worse than two o'clock in the morning talking to someone that you, you know, that you used to bang and trying to get them to come back. And, and the thing is, Again, if you ever wind yourself in that position, realize that eventually you're going to meet somebody else and don't humiliate yourself. So 16 years later, you sit there going, God, I should not have fucking done that. So I did that. So Stephanie, and needless to say, she did not come back to me. So that did not happen. But, uh, but boy, did I sure look great singing it. I'm sure I was fantastic. Because uh, what because I'm, sure, I'm sure you can tell now, even with strep throat, I have an amazing voice. 
so, so to get back to Tom, I'm singing, uh, you know, don't uh, come back to me or no, I'm not, no, I'm not singing that to Katie. What if I say, you know what? I should sing it to her now. I should find Katie now and sing that to her. Come back to me. Even though she was never with me, I should still sing it to try to get her to come back to me. Uh, so no, so I, I'm back in Tahoe and I'm in the bar with Katie and I'm singing, don't you want me Katie at the top of my lungs. And in the middle of it, somebody comes to me and they're like, dude, Ransom's in a fight outside. Ransom's my roommate. And, uh, and Ransom can handle himself. Ransom, Ransom's like a martial artist. He was, I think he was a blue belt uh, uh, in, in Kung Fu and karate because he was in the Marines and whatever. So they're like, he's in a fight. So that's all I got to hear. He's in a fight. So I immediately, I go running outside and I just see Ransom getting pounded by three apes. Just these three dudes are, are wailing on him and, and he's trying to fight back, but he can't because it's three dudes and they have their shirts off. Uh, and that, that's a trick, by the way. And, uh, uh, let me give you more street fighting lessons like I did a couple of weeks ago when I told you the guy was screaming at me with his hands in his pockets. He's trying to you know, scare me off because he's yelling and he's being loud, but he doesn't really want to fight. These guys want to fight. They have their shirts off so nobody can grab them. So it's, it's like a, because, you know, the first thing you do is you go for purchase. You try to grab a guy and you try to either go hockey fight on him or you just start flinging right hands or left hands, whichever hand you've got free and which other, you grab the shirt and just start wailing. Or you grab the shirt and control them and you take them to the ground. So I see they have their shirts off. So, and they're on ransom. So immediately I just go, all right, well, there's three guys. I got to, I just jump in. So I, I immediately go after this one guy and, uh, I, I take a swing at him and I miss and he comes charging at me. So I'm running backwards and I plant with my right, my right foot and I come forward and I throw a right hand and I blast him right in the face and I break his nose. So I, cause his nose just blew up like blood immediately shot at the bottom and it went right to the side of his, his, uh, his face. It like kind of turned sideways. So I see that. So I think, all right, I got to do, I got to just hit him in the nose one more time. And he's done. I mean, I just got to finish him. Then I only got two guys to worry about. So I hit him in the face. His nose explodes. I cock my fist back and I go to hit him again. He ducks, ducks his head. I punch him right on top of the head. And I actually hear my hand break in my own head. I just hear it go. And I, and I immediately yelled something that I, you know, shouldn't yell. And I'm, uh, but my hand, so I then go after, but he's out. So he falls down. I go after the other two guys and the one guy comes charging at me and he punches me in the face and I, I'm still throwing right hands. Cause you, you know, your adrenaline's rushing. You're not even thinking about it, but I, I land a couple and I hit this guy and then the cops come and everything gets broken up. And, uh, uh, luckily I don't have to go to jail because these three, uh, the, the cops knew me from bouncing at the other bar and they're like, what happened? And I said, they jumped Mark, you know, that's ransom's name, Mark. And, uh, uh, and they're, they're like, okay. So they arrest those guys. And the funny thing is they arrest those guys. And, uh, it was a holiday weekend. It was a, it was a Friday night of a holiday weekend and they put them in jail and they, they were from San Diego. I wound up talking to the cops later and finding out and they had to spend the entire three day weekend in jail because nobody's going to come up from San Diego and bail them out. So they, they made them just stay in there. So that was great. Uh, ransom was a, you know, kind of beat up. And then I go back into the club and we hang out the next morning. I wake up and my right hand has, I mean, just swelled up. It, it looks like the hamburger helper hand, you know, the, the, from the, from the hamburger helper commercials. And it actually has an eyes and a nose. That's how badly it was broken. It's just crazy big. And, and I know something's wrong with it. I knew it was broken, but I had hoped it wasn't. Uh, so I had to go to the emergency room for that. Uh, so I go to the emergency room and, uh, here's something I should tell you about, uh, my friend, Katie, who I had the, the massive crush on that hung out with me all the time and left her uh, two or three kids at home alone. Uh, one of them was old enough so he could watch them, uh, but she would come out to bars and stuff with us all the time. And uh, her husband uh, would either be home with the kids or he'd be off at one of his two jobs. Uh, one of which was fireman, which would mean he would off, he would be off staying in the firehouse for like two, three days at a time. Or he was at his other job of emergency room technician. <laughs> Steve was a uh, EMT. And so I had to go in to see Steve in the emergency room and tell him that I was out with his drunken wife the previous night and had broken my hand on some ape's head from San Diego. Uh, I walk and, St and by the way, I should tell you, Steve, the most understanding, nicest, greatest guy ever. And uh, I'm sure, you know, Katie wouldn't agree with that. And uh, but I'm just saying from my end, because she was in the bar with me and DJ every single night. Uh, at lunch with us hanging out. I mean, she's hanging out with these two 21 year old buffoons while her husband is working these two different jobs. And, uh, uh, you know, and, and, and she was a great mom. She was really good to her kids. Everything was great. We got along great with the kids, but the point is we shouldn't be getting along great with the kids. We're 21 year old idiots. So why is she hanging out with us? But Steve was really understanding and really cool. But I can tell you, I think he probably took a little extra special pleasure in setting my hand that day because it was the worst pain I've ever felt. He's like, all right, well, you know what? Your hand's swollen. We're going to have to, you have what's called a boxer's fracture. That's what he called it because apparently I had broken my four knuckles all the way across. And he goes, what we have to do is set your hand and put a cast on it. So he grabs my hand 
and he's they squeeze it so they have to set it together and it was i my eyes went to pinholes i almost passed out because the fucking pain rush that happened so yeah as, as nice as steve was i'm sure he just took a little extra special pleasure in squeezing my broken hand that night knowing i'd been out partying with his drunken wife the night before <laughs> Uh, so yeah, so that's, uh, there you go. That's my visits to the emergency room. And, uh, I'll tell you this, I will, uh, I have a few things I wanted to mention before I get out of here. I wanted to tell you about my appearance on David Lawrence's radio show last week. Uh, I was actually on for an hour and that will air in San Francisco on some radio station that I unfortunately don't know. You'll have to go to David Lawrence's website to find out where, but, uh, you can also buy the hour that I was on. If you wanted to go ahead and download it. Uh, I think it's a buck it might be a buck. It's uh, it's three bucks. I apologize. And, and, Christ, why wouldn't you want to pay three bucks to hear me talk for an hour when you just heard me talk for an hour for free? <laughs> By all means, cough up three singles and get uh, another hour of me talking to David. Uh, but it was it was a good show and it's well worth listening to. So go ahead and buy uh, that if you can. And uh, if you cannot or if you just are a podcast person, I did a few podcasts this past week. I was actually on David's Online Tonight podcast. You can search David Lawrence on iTunes or search Online Tonight. I did a show Friday and Saturday, I think. Uh, I did back-to-back podcasts with him, so go ahead and check it out. And you'll definitely want to listen to the first one because it's me talking about this podcast. God knows you want to hear this podcast and then go listen to a podcast of me talking about this podcast. Enjoy me. How meta are we going to get? You know what? Spike Jones should just produce this show next week. Eric, you're out. Uh, I also did, I did Paul Goebel's show, the King of TV podcast with Paul Goebel and Jim Bruce, two funny guys, two good friends. They had me on. We did an hour long show. I have not heard it yet. Uh, but I actually referenced it earlier today I, in this episode. I told you that there's a story they told, whatever. So go listen to it. It was a lot of fun. Talked about Hell's Kitchen, talked about transsexuals and, uh, go listen to it. And, uh, and, uh, it's funny. I was talking to my buddy, Pat, and uh, I told, uh, I told Pat that I was doing Paul's show and he's like, dude, Paul's shows are like two hours long. I said, really? Cause I, 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 I'll check it out. And sometimes they're long, but sometimes they're, they fit the, you know, whatever, because the ones I've done haven't been two hours, but I can't, I can't understand how Paul's doing a two hour podcast. I, that that's, that's fucking double life Goble. That's what that is. That's, that's straight up Ted Nugent, double life Goble. Uh, so I, either way, go listen to my show. I think it's an hour long and it was a lot of fun. Um, I have people writing about appearances. You know what? I'm still trying to book stuff to get on the road and hopefully come to your town, come to Portland, come to Seattle. Uh, you know, uh, Chicago and, and I'm, I'm trying, let's put it that way, you know, with, without representation, with just me calling people, it's, it's a stiff, I'm not going to lie to you. It's kind of a brick, but I'm trying. So hopefully coming out and doing appearances, hopefully be in Chicago sometime this summer. Uh, I will tell you that if you're in Los Angeles, May 6th, I will be, uh, at the see you next Tuesday show at the UCB theater. Come see me, uh, on a very funny show. I don't know who the other comedians are going to be, but I'm sure they're fantastic. Uh, and then I'll be there as well. So come and check us out at the UCB theater in Los Angeles. You can go to UCB theater.com. I think, and check it out and find out when it is. I think it's 10.30 p.m. on uh, Saturday, uh, Tuesday, May 6th. So come out and check that out. Uh, so what have I got? I got Goble. I got uh, that. Oh, and also, I'll tell you what. Starting this weekend, I'm going to be writing a column, uh, uh, a weekly column for the ComedyFilmNerds.com website. This is a website run by my good friends Graham Elwood and Chris Mancini, two very funny guys, and they have been nice enough to ask me to contribute to that site, so I will. Uh, ComedyFilmNerds.com, that's C-O-M-E-D-Y-F-I-L-M-N-E-R-D-S.com. I don't know why I spelled that out. That was that was ComedyFilmRetard.com, spelling that out. But go to ComedyFilmNerds.com because I'll be writing a column for them, uh, you know, hopefully weekly, depending on how much my lazy ass can get done. So, uh We'll see what happens, but definitely this, by the end of this weekend, I will have a column up because, uh, by the time you listen to this, I will be in a theater watching Iron Man, my friends. And then I'll be writing about my experiences with that. So, uh, go ahead and check out comedyfilmnerds.com. They have a lot of cool stuff for sale. Go get Graham Elwood's DVD. Chris Mancini has some short films there. I'm actually in one of those short films, a film called hit clown. Uh, go ahead. If you want to see fat Mike playing a lascivious bookie and, uh, you remember lascivious bookie, don't you, by the way, open for Prince and the revolution back in 1998. Uh, I don't know if the revolution was there. It might've just been Prince. Uh, it might've been just the glyph, the hieroglyph symbol Prince. Uh, but lascivious uh, bookie was absolutely there. So, uh, so go ahead, check that out. Go ahead and buy something from comedyfilmnerds.com. Read my column by the end of the weekend. Check me out on these podcasts. Always remember to come back here. Go to mikeschmidtcomedy.com for all future communiques and appearances. Go to myspace.com slash mikeschmidtcomedy. You can always listen to the episodes on either of those sites, or you can subscribe through iTunes. You can actually subscribe right now through my website. There's now a subscribe button, so go ahead and take care of that. My good friend Brian Soma at Group Soma went ahead and took care of that. He's my web guy. If you need any web stuff, go to groupsoma.com and check it out. Brian did a great job for me. 
And that's that. So this is it. It's the 40 year old boy. Hopefully you guys stay subscribed. Hopefully you guys go ahead and subscribe. Hopefully you guys subscribe to magazines that have my names in them. If there is no, there's no way that my name is in a magazine, but if there was, wouldn't it be great? Uh, what if there was a Mike Schmidt podcast magazine? I'd have to give away it for free because let's face it, the, all these podcasts, I, that's, I'm carving out a niche as the guy who works for free all over the place. I'm going to do these kind of podcasts. I'm going to, you know what? I may just shout podcasts on a street corner. People can walk by. It's kind of like the original podcast, just me standing there with my head in the stocks. Like it was like 18th century England or, I don't know, something from Gangs of New York. I just got in the town square with my hand all locked up and my head was hanging out there and I just go ahead and sit there and go. person overall so uh and go ahead and by all means judge that i'm kind of a jag off i got the future what am i talking about but i am a jag off uh, and i'm not a jerk i'm a nice guy it's just i guess i have jerky tendencies i've done so much ridiculous stuff and then i, I wonder afterwards i'm like man how come i don't uh, hang out with anybody here's why because you're a dick Yeah, 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 yeah